Good afternoon. Today's um, weblog is going to be about a case which came out at the beginning of September, which may be quite significant in the world of Murridge. It's Primins versus Kline, a decision of Andrew Baker, Justice Andrew Baker, and it came out on the 7th of September. It's basically about what actually does de Murridge cover? Something which has been unresolved really since um, Radar and Arcos back in 1927. The case involves a delay of some 31 days in berthing in China. The receivers allege that the cargo has been damaged as a result of this delay. They arrest the ship for $6 million and the owners settle for $1 million. And you might actually wonder why anything has to be paid by the owners with the Hague Bisbee rules, um, bill of lading, and of course there would be a clear defence uh, um, under Article 42Q. But I think this, I think um, possibly the venue of um, the arrest uh, might have made it difficult for owners to um, successfully defend their claim. They get off with one sixth of the liability which was initially demanded. So they paid out a million dollars and they now need to find somebody to recover from. So what about your voyage charters? Well, they allege a breach of contract. You have failed to discharge within the lay days, that's breach of contract. Now charters are going to say, well, yeah, but doesn't the demurrage cover that? Well, this has got what the preliminary issue of law was about. Now, on the assumption that the cargo damage was caused by the delay in discharging in China, was that consequence of the breach, the breach of charters in not discharging within the lay days, was that covered by the demurrage provided in the charter party? Or can owners claim this as a separate heading of loss. Now, if you look at the general law of contract, you could say, well, this is a liquidated damages case and li liquidated damages cover all the consequences of a particular breach of contract. Therefore, demurred should cover all the consequences of this breach of the obligation to discharge in the lay days. And these are some recent cases which in the general law of contract confirm the exclusivity of a liquidated damages clause. Alternatively, you could look at the, you could put your shipping law hat on. And after all, shipping and contract law don't always sort of see eye to eye, even though both involve contracts, and say, well, let's look at the commercial purpose of demand. This is to cover detention damage, loss of use of the vessel. It's not intended to cover other types of damage flowing from the breach, whatever they might be. So we've got two competing alternatives before Mr. Justice Andrew Baker. And he goes for the second one. For him, the key question is, what does the law take to be covered by a demurrage rate? What does a demurrage liquidate? This is something which actually isn't spelt out by demurrage clauses and charter parties. And he takes a commercial shipping law view of this issue rather than the general contractual issue relating to liquidated damages clauses at large. So let's have a look at some previous authority. If you've got a breach of the obligation to load in lay guys, the only detention damages you're going to get are demurrage, even if delay is for an unreasonable period. And that's clear from the Suisse Atlantique. If you've got a different breach which results in detention damage, you'll still only get demurrage. That's Ember Kip and Bongi and Chandras and Isbranson. Isbranson. Now, Raider and Arcos is a difficult case. 
We've got delay in loading at Archangel in Russia. And because of that delay in loading, the ship cannot load the full amount of cargo. She's going to be overloaded by the time she gets into the port of discharge in England, and she's going to be subject to a fine. So less than the full amount of cargo is actually loaded. At first instance and in the Board of Appeal, it is unanimously decided that de dead freight will be recoverable. But why? Well, one approach is to say that actually there's a single breach and there are two different losses and um, the demurrage provision is not something which covers both types of losses. It only covers potential damages. That's Lord Justice Banks. Then there's the view that actually there are two different breaches, and this is a breach of the obligation to load a full and complete cargo, and um, the demarriage clause has got nothing to do with um, how you um, compensate for that separate breach. That's Lord Justice Sargent and Mr Justice Greer at first instance, and it's slightly unclear what Lord Justice Atkin thinks. So we have a rather ambiguous Court of Appeal Authority back in 1927. What about first instance authority? Well, you've got the Altus by Mr. Justice Webster in the 1980s. As a short shipment, that means you get a reduced demurrage rate. And he holds that that is not confined by the dead freight clause. That you can make a separate claim other than a claim for dead freight for the losses that you've suffered as a result of having a reduced demurrage rate because you haven't loaded the full cargo. If you've loaded the full cargo, the demurrage rate would have been um, higher under the terms of that particular charter. As against that, there is the body of Mr. Justice Potter in 1991. Mr. Justice Potter clearly takes the view that um, you can't claim anything more than a marriage unless you can show a separate breach. Now, the problem for Andrew Baker is that there's the convention that it's very difficult for a first instance judge when he's the third in line and he's considering an issue which has been considered by two previous first instance judges and they disagreed. He should go along with the second one, unless there's really good reasons for um, saying that that, that decision is wrong. Um, here, he says, I can discount the Altus because it's actually, although Webster makes observations about the effect of radar and Arcos, these are not essential to his decision. So actually, it's only the Bondi where this issue has subsequently been decided at first instance. Therefore, I'm the second judge, not the first, not the third judge. I can, I'm quite free to go my own way and reach a different decision to that of Mr. Potter, Mr. Justice Potter, and that's exactly what he does. So, what about Potter J in the bond? It's a claim under an offer FOB sale, and he applies the ratio. What he applies the ratio of radar, which he states as being that. If you want to claim a separate head of loss other than detention, and for detention, demurrage is the exclusive remedy, you need to establish a separate breach of that of loading or not loading within the lay phase. And on the facts of the Bondi, there was no such separate breach. That's a decision which Mr. Justice Andrew uh, uh, Baker decides that he will not follow because it is commercially unsound. It's not what demurrage is meant to do. Demurrage is only meant to cover detention losses. Any other types of losses um, which result from a breach of the obligation to load or discharge within the lay days, those losses are at large, they are not affected by the demurrage clause and can be recovered separately. So as it stands, the effect of this decision is only detention damages are covered by demurrage. 
But don't think that this gives owners carte blanche to get damages for losing the chance to get higher freight rates. I mean, this is what was tried in the Swiss at Londing and failed. This is purely um, detention damages. It's not going to work. Similarly, for additional port charges or wharfages which ha happen, or additional bunkers which you consume during your time under marriage, that's all part of detention losses, which is uh, covered by the demerit rate. Now, when you come to non-detention losses, such as cargo liability to third parties, I, I do generally, genuinely scratch my head as to how there could have been such a liability to third parties. Remember that now that we're disconnected from the demerit clause, uh, it will be open to the charters to rely on general exceptions clauses in the charter party. So that you can't do as regards detention losses um, because you, you, these general exceptions don't apply um, as regards um, time on demerit. And also, if you have got a clause paramount, Article 4, 3 of the Hague Rules may well provide you with a defence. Some tricky questions. Supposing you've got bottom fouling due to extended time waiting in birth. Now, that's something which may well be uh, non-detention consequential losses which could be recoverable. It'd be interesting to see what happens on that. Increasing port charges, I don't think so. I think port charges are, whatever their nature, are covered within retention damages, that these are something which demurrage clauses will cover, along with any um, bunkers which you consume during the um, period of retention. I remember you need a breach by the charters to make a claim. Um, Mr Justice Andrew Baker was quite clear that if the owners couldn't establish a breach, then they couldn't recover the cargo claim by way of indemnity. And remember that you may get demurrage compensation for delays due to waiting for orders under a waiting for order clause or an interim ports clause, or there may be an implied agreement between the parties due to, um, as regards, waiting for orders. Well, in none of those situations is there actually any breach of contract. You're not going to get an indemnity. Um, and th th there's no breach of contract, so if there's resulting cargo damage as a result of a delay in waiting for orders, well, the ship owner is, uh, is not going to have a hook to recover uh, those damages from the charterer. What about the future? Leave apparently has been given to appeal to the Court of Appeal, and I just wonder whether this will actually go up to the Supreme Court. And if it does, would it be a contract decision or a voyage charter or shipping law decision? And I would uh, make a comparison with the Achilleus back in 2008. This is a shipping decision about a measure of damages for late re-delivery. And at first instance, in the Court of Appeal, we get an orthodox contract decision. But when it comes up to the House of Lords, we get a commercial time charter decision based really on the expectations of the market as to what you uh, will get by way of damages for a late re-delivery. So we wait with bated breath to see what happens in the future. So thank you for your attention and I hope you have found this brief weblog of interest. Goodbye for now.